When Monster ended, nobody wanted to leave the theater. About five years ago, a beautiful movie took American audiences by surprise. It told the story of a fabricated, makeshift Asian family that had to live in the shadows of the law just to get by. I'm not talking about Parasite, by the way. I'm talking about shoplifters. I happen to see shoplifters in theaters in Portland, Oregon. Uh, not people shoplifting, but the movie shoplifters. And it got me hooked on the films of Hirokazu Kureda. I really think that he is one of the greatest living directors, at least for me. If you like serious, mature, humanist, boring films, beautiful films the way that I do, uh, you have to acquaint yourself with his work. Monster is his newest film. I saw it last week at the IFC, which is also where I saw Parasite a few years ago. Bong Joon-ho and Song Kang-ho were at the screening um, of Parasite that I attended. And yes, in this movie, I will be saying all these names backwards. Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about Monster. This is not a scary movie. Don't worry. It's another unflinchingly humanist social drama. It's another incredibly beautiful and moving film. Uh, like I said, when this thing finished up, people were frozen. I wasn't sure my legs were going to work. I thought I might be living in the theater for uh, the foreseeable future. One of the defining characteristics of Kareda's films is that they are moving. I guess the other one is that they're slow. They're slow moving. This movie, I think, is relatively accessible, but I'm not great at judging that, and the pace is certainly slower than your average Marvel film. There's, I guess, two things you might want to know about the personnel of this movie. First, the music is by Ryuichi Sakamoto, who died in March of 2023. This is his penultimate film. It's the last film that he scored. His last film is called Opus, and it features only him performing his compositions alone in a recording studio for the last time on the verge of his death to cancer. Sakamoto had a legendary career, and somehow I think this is still one of the highlights. Sakamoto was too weak to compose the entire score, so some of the pieces, most of them actually, are recycled from his earlier work. Nonetheless, I think you can hear in the music the dwindling of Sakamoto's life. Even if you don't watch the movie, you should listen to the score. It's incredible, and it will catch on in a flash, I think. In the film, the music isn't overbearing, but it's a big part of the movie, and it's a big part of the stunning ending, one of the most powerful endings I've, I've experienced in a long time. The song at the end is called Aqua, and it's actually from Sakamoto's album BTTB, Back to the Basics, from 1999. The music is one of the reasons why even during the first shots, the very few first seconds of this movie, I was already becoming emotional, perhaps some kind of Pavlovian response to a Koreda film. The other big thing about this movie is that it was not written by Hirokazu Koreda. It, uh, the screenplay is done by somebody else, which is a bit uncommon in Koreda's career. The screenplay here was written by Yuji Sakamoto, no relation to the composer. I don't know much about this guy. It seems like he has mainly written television uh, and plays. In general, the script is right up Koreda's alley, and I'll give you some specifics about that, but I think there are also some noticeable-ish divergences that make this movie a little bit different some, from some of Kareda's other uh, works. This film did win Best Screenplay at Cannes. It got another award there, too. I'd tell you which one, but it might kind of spoil the movie. They only show the screenplay uh, palm leaf up on the screen at the beginning of the movie. That's interesting. I'm not sure I've, I've seen uh, something like that before. Anyway, Kareda is known, one thing he's known for, I guess, is making movies uh, with kids in them, movies about kids. And this is another one. When I talk about Kareda's career here, I'm going to talk about it just in this millennium. In the 90s, his movies were a little bit different, um, but I'm not going to touch on those uh, today. The child acting in this movie is incredible, um, and the children are written really well. Most of the time, uh, I avoid movies uh, with kids in them, just as I avoid kids in general. <laughs> um, here, I think Kareda is one of the few directors I trust to get it right. Um, it's a little bit hard to judge acting in another language, but like I said, the acting seems incredible. And the way that the characters are written is really, really something. Often child characters don't actually have much depth, I guess. Their main traits are sometimes just that they are kids. Um, the kids in this movie seem maybe, if anything, a bit like adults, not in an unrealistic way, but in a sense that they have dignity and intelligence. They're real people which is not the case, I think, in a lot of movies. Kareda's empathy towards kids is remarkable. 
Um, at first, some of the plot lines in this movie and in his other movies, they might sound a little bit melodramatic. Here, we have a kid who's raised by a single mother. In his earlier film, Nobody Knows, which is one of his most well-known films before Shoplifters, I guess, um, some kids have to take care of themselves completely after their parents leave. It, it sounds like it might be melodramatic, but it does not end up feeling that way. More than just being about kids, though, I think that Kareda's films are about families, specifically the structuring elements of a family, the structure of a family. Across his movies, we have almost every possible permutation of the family. We've got single mothers, we've got no parents, we've got two kids that are switched with one another. I forget exactly what happens in the film Still Walking, that's a beautiful movie, but there's, there's some kind of mystery about the family there, too. These domestic mysteries are one of the things that power a lot of Kareda's movies. Even as they are naturalistic, humanist films, uh, they're pulled along a little bit by these, these mysteries about what exactly is going on in a family. It seems like things are normal, so to speak, but you get these hints, these intricate little hints that something is a little bit different. Shoplifters, it fits into this mold exactly. I don't think there's one obvious takeaway from all these movies. Often, though, we see the significance of family and how it relates to some other forces. For instance, in Still Walking, the traditional and ritualistic aspects of Japanese culture are pushing up against some of the realities of modern middle-class life. And where do these tensions come to the surface? Through the family, uh, through the interactions with the grandparents, through elder care and questions of end of life, through the question of what it means to be a family, how a family is defined, we see all these other questions of, uh, in society and the world um, come to the front. In Like Father, Like Son, which is probably one of my all-time favorite movies. I mean, that is truly an incredible movie. A movie I think, uh, if, if I were president, everyone would be required to watch this movie before having, having children. Uh, I, think, I don't think that's unconstitutional. I think, I think that'd be okay. Um, in, in Like Father, Like Son, we see how class, and particularly the social pressures of an affluent upbringing, can redefine um, the family, or again, how those, those social factors can shape what it means to be a family. Redefining family, I think, is the key phrase, maybe. That's at the heart of almost every Kareda movie uh, in this millennium. This movie also buys into that idea a little bit, but it's not quite as central. This movie focuses on a kid named Minato, Minato and his mother, Saori. One of their domestic traditions is to celebrate the birthday of Minato's father, who is deceased but lives on in the house inside of a picture frame. After they eat the birthday cake, Saori asks Minato to give his father an update on everything that has been happening lately. And Minato says, well, I can't do that when you're here listening. What an interesting little scene. I mean, it seems like Saori is really trying to get inside of Minato's head, trying to understand what's going on for Minato, but he can't really let her in. In a lesser movie, this would be put down to the fickleness of youth, I think. Uh, just a, a kid being a kid, doesn't want to tell his mom something, has a secret, you know? Th these darn kids, that's what they do. But in Monster, we empathize with Minato. When he feels like there's things that he can't tell his mother, or almost anybody, it's not... Uh, it, it's, not it's not just him being a, a silly kid. We, we empathize with him, and not just because the movie eventually reveals what's going on inside of his head and some of the circumstances that lead him to feeling like this, but also because he just has a profound dignity throughout the movie that, that is uncommon. That said, there are a couple pieces, even in what I've just described, that are maybe a bit more on the nose than I would expect from Kareda's uh, movies. Like the way we find out about the father being deceased, it's kind of a cheap line. You sort of already get the sense, oh, the father's not around, this is a single mother, and yet they kind of have to shove it in your face a little bit. Kareda's other movies, that does not happen. Uh, there's a lot to be made just from implication, just from listening and, and looking closely at the movie. And there's moments like that here too, but there's also moments that are a little bit more in your face. This movie is structured a bit like Rochamon. Uh, that's the comparison a lot of people make. We see the story a couple times from a couple of different perspectives. Indeed, that is like the mechanic in Rochamon, but that movie is worlds apart for many different reasons. This is an interesting mechanic, and, and partly it's interesting just because it is a mechanic that's not quite at home in Kareda's hyper-understated and hyper-naturalistic movies. 
I guess. I mean, it, 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 there may be some tension between those things. I think in this movie, things still work out nicely. The structure of the movie is a little bit jarring. If you don't know what to expect, I didn't know anything about this movie going into it. And when we sort of went back to the beginning to see the story again, I was like, oh, <laughs> so this is how it's going to be. But it works out, and it creates some of the shifts in perspective that we get in a lot of Kareda's movies. A shift in perspective is a great way to create subtlety, you know what I mean? Show something from the other angle. But this is maybe a slightly artificial way of doing that, a slightly artificial way of adding subtlety and engendering empathy. The first part of the movie follows Sayori. The second part follows Mr. Hori, a teacher at Minato's school. And the last part follows uh, Minato, although it also gives us a few glimpses at the school's principal. Um, I'm not going to talk about the second two parts because I don't want to spoil this amazing movie, even though the third part is probably the best part of the movie by far and is truly incredible. Um, but let me talk about the first part a little bit more. There's, there's a few other pieces I don't think are quite as subtle as most of Kareda's stuff. Um, at one point, for instance, Sari goes to the school to have a conference with the principal. That ends up uh, being not so much a conference as a confrontation. These scenes are some of the weakest in the movie um, when Sayori is kind of um, uh, imploring the, the teachers at the school to uh, give her more information. These scenes are cheap and unrealistic to me. They felt like television. The principal is a good character. The first time we see her, she is on her knees cleaning the floor of the school, uh, different from what a principal in the United States might do. Um, it's an interesting introductory shot. Speaking of which, the first time that we meet Mr. Hori, it's also an interesting introductory shot. We've heard a lot about him at this point. We know, we, we know all about him, we think, but we don't know what he looks like. Three teachers enter the room at the same time. This is as part of one of these meetings with Sayori. Three teachers walk in, and we know that one of them is Mr. Hori, but we don't know who it is. Eventually, he stands up, revealing himself to be surprisingly young. Kareda really delays this as much as possible, though. I mean, he is completely in control. A director who understands how the audience watches a movie, who understands what's going on in people's heads while they're watching it, who understands, hey, if I delay this, uh, people will wonder, oh, who is it? It's a pretty clever way um, to add tension to a movie that is, for the most part, extremely naturalistic. Anyway, it turns out that the principal has only recently returned to the school after facing a personal tragedy uh, in the death of her grandson, grandchild. She might uh, sound like an empathetic character, but the things get a bit complicated. Um, for some reason, just about every character in the movie feels the need to ask her directly about this tragedy, to poke her about it. This is another low point in the movie. The best scene in the movie by far, I think, involves the principal. It's one of my, I mean, it's one of the greatest scenes I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, I don't want to disclose anything about it, but if you watch the movie, you will know which one it is. Um, there are some weak points in this early section, though. This drama at the school between teachers and parents has a little bit of a 2023 inflection to it that I don't exactly love. So like I said, while the script is in some ways a perfect match for Kareda and it fits some of the themes, there are also a few ways in which this wasn't quite as subtle as I would have liked. These are really my only complaints about the movie, though, so don't get it twisted. I love this movie. I mean, it is, it's incredible. Um, and it's possible even that some of these things I'm complaining about might actually make the movie a little bit easier, more accessible, um, a little bit less boring for most people. So maybe I shouldn't be complaining about them at all. I don't know. Kareda is a humanist. His movies are best experienced with your emotions. So I don't want to try to graph everything out and make a big uh, uh, corkboard with red string on it. Uh, there are some interesting images here and there. I mean, there are some interesting formal things in the movie. There is a motif of one shoe uh, that comes up a few times, and maybe this echoes Minato's upbringing with one parent. Uh, the movie is kind of elemental. It starts with a fire. It ends with a bunch of water. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of water throughout the movie. In fact, you could make something of that if you want to. There's a bunch of trains in the movie. You could make something of that if you want to. I mean, you know, water trains, those are a big part of Japan's sort of industrial and also cultural heritage in some ways. Um, I think there's also an interesting balance in this movie between tourist Japan, the Japan of anime, and something a little more raw. Uh, we see tunnels and drainage ditches, abandoned places, things like that. If I had to pick one theme that really defines the movie, though, one thing that's actually important, unlike everything I've just sort of described, which is maybe not as significant, 
maybe what I would pick is isolation. In a lot of other Koreda movies, some kind of makeshift family is formed, like I said. Uh, in this movie, that doesn't really happen to some degree. Most people here are alone. It's possible that this is related to some of the conditions of suspicion and contempt that define today's world in some ways. We don't really see anything about a traditional family in this movie, which is interesting. That's supposed to be a big, big part of Japan, uh, I guess. But, you know, we don't go to visit the grandparents. And in fact, the one grandparental visit that the movie alludes to with the principal, it ends in disaster. It goes quite poorly. Um, this, is, this is a movie about a lot of people who are, who are on their own. And it's sort of interesting that it would be, should be called Monster. And it's sort of interesting that it should have this um, um, structure of showing different perspectives and how uh, divergent they can be when everybody uh, is alone in particular. In contrast to all this isolation, though, one absolutely beautiful relationship grows, maybe two, depending on how you view the end of the movie. It's tough to talk about this film completely without talking about the last two sections, but like I said, I don't want to spoil it for you. And, you know, this is a humanist movie. The best thing is really just get you out there and experience it. Um, Kareda has done it again, I think. Um, yes, there are some traces here that he didn't write the movie, um, but he's done it again. Another incredible film that, uh, I guess we got to give this a rating on the Tobin rating system. Well, it's a strong 16. It feels almost, uh, uh, a joke to call it a mere 16. Um, could be much higher. Um, but that's, uh, that's Monster. Hey, if you live in a cool place with a cool movie theater, uh, maybe you can see it, uh, while, uh, on a, on a big screen. If not, uh, you should find a way to watch it one way or another. Or if you can't watch this one, I would recommend any of Kareda's movies. Uh, they are really incredible.